screen. OK, it works. So sharing the screen. OK. Please let me know if you can see this. Yes, your slides are up. OK, great. So good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Malankova, and today I will present Dr. Goldsmith and I's research on mocha diffusion. So mocha diffusion is a pottery design technique which produces patterns resembling circular dendrites, such as the figure shown on the left. It depends on various chemical interactions and variables such as uh, particle size, acidity, uh, composition, gravity, and viscosity. It works through the involvement of two suspensions, a clay slip, which serves as a colloid. Um, it is typically the lower suspension, which is smeared on the vase or a ceramical figure, and an oxide suspension, which is applied dropwise on top of the clay colloid. In history, it is believed that mocha diffusion started when potters were chewing tobacco and accidentally spat some of some in the wet pot, uh, creating an interesting pattern due to a mild acidic nature of nicotine. Eventually, such designs grew more attention and potters formed desired patterns through boiling of tobacco leaves and forming a thick viscous sludge, which was mixed with colorant and water. So while there is a uh, great history to the technique, exact intera interactions that produce the dendritic pattern remain unknown. The many people are curious, not many people are curious about the scientific side of art technique, and a lot of websites which discuss mocha diffusion simply say, go and play with it. <laughs> Nobody investigated why exactly those patterns form, and an ideal recipe is not identified, both because recipe forms upon go and play method and because companies that manage to make the slip work actually keep it a secret. Uh, the goal of this research is to find an ideal combination of clay and oxide suspensions, the two suspensions I mentioned earlier, which, require, which are required for mocha diffusion, um, to create an aesthetically pleasing dendritic pattern. In other words, we're looking for perfect conditions to make a visually perfect pattern. So materials. The clay slip or the bottom suspension typically involves ball clay, kaolin, also known as EPK, and the silica source. Different recipes online differ in what they suggest. Some suggest different sources of silica, others suggest chemical compounds such as bentonite. The upper suspension or the oxide suspension typically involves a source of color, which can be pigments, stains, um, it can be chemicals such as iron oxide black or rutile, copper red, cobalt oxide, titanium oxide, and many others. Um, it also involves a source of acid, and this is just judging by the information found online that we were initially provided with. The so-called acid portion of the oxide suspension is the one that we experimented with a lot at first, using apple cider vinegar, ethanol, water, soap, lemon juice, lime juice, and other household chemicals, typically present in like every household. Another side note is that while some online sources say that carbonates and stains perform better than oxides, um, and say that iron oxide black actually does not work, iron oxide black will actually be the star of this presentation. So even though I previously mentioned that mocha diffusion requires two slips, um, here I will go into a little bit more detail as to how this process is performed. Typically, a leather hard dry test tile is used and the clay slip is poured over it to cover a good amount, if not all of the surface. It is important to use a leather hard dry test tile because in other dryness levels, there can be a big chance that the tile can crack or chip. Then an oxide suspension is created um, and a camel hair brush is used to apply the oxide dropwise upon the ceramic vase or a surface. The interfacial tension that and the instability that exists between the two liquids then develops a design, but I will get to that to the mechanism portion later. The resulting tile is usually fired in a kiln, as with a normal clay vase or a bowl or any other product. However, the temperatures of the kiln often cause the results to go significantly, um, can significantly change the results. So it is hypothesized that concentration of pigment plays a crucial role in the preservation of the dendritic design post firing. So online, the only proposed mechanism involved in mocha diffusion and therefore the only scientific conclusion made about the design formation prior to this research was the Marangoni effect. And the Mar Marangoni effect is the disturbance in mass transfer within the liquid-liquid medium due to instability between two liquids, the clay slip and the oxide slip. However, there's definitely more than Marangoni effect involved in the design um, technique. Dr. Goldsmith and I observed something similar to the formation of river deltas, which we both call random walk effect. It is when the oxide slip travels where it can, forming small separate rivers and dendrites during diffusion. 
Initial procedures were all based on vague directions given on online, a lot of which insisted on the go and play method. At first, the experiments did not have a particular set path or structure because they focus, um, we focused on optimizing the slips found online. If the slips did not work, water content and silica content were changed. Eventually, when the recipe for clay slip and oxide slip were optimized, different oxide concentrations were used within optimized suspension. For example, iron oxide content could be doubled or half uh, to observe the results. In terms of particle size, we tried to experiment with different, different silica content. Um, so, for example, depending on the mesh of the silica content or individual particle size, the result will change. One example um, that definitely worked was the granular rutile. Um, that will be shown later in the results slides. We also experimented with pH properties and the polar and nonpolar interactions. For the pH, we either acidified the slips or removed the acid content completely. In other, in other cases, we would use something like apple cider vinegar um, and we'll double the content to observe the changes. General results. As for right now, iron oxide has shown um, to develop the best dendritic patterns. They are not only dark, but also clear in the random walk effect moments. The slip and oxide interaction also de de depended on silica content and water content. Online, it was said that the clay slip must have the viscosity of around uh, 1030 water oil. However, we did not have a viscometer, so um, we had to change the water and silica content to change the viscosity. The most optimal slip that we used um, up to date generally followed the, the rule of not being too thin and not being too thick. So finally, higher concentration of oxide loading created more visible patterns. This will be discussed in the next few slides. So iron oxide black produced the best results to date. The two pictures on the left use an optimized clay slip with standard loading of iron oxide solution. As you can see, it forms a very nice flower-like design with prominent dendrites at the terminal end. The initial radius um, displays a Marangoni, Marangoni effect, um, more of a diffusion dispersion than dendrites, while the terminal end displays a river delta-like random walk effect. For comparison, I attached a picture on the, in the middle, which shows the drastic difference with adding a single drop more. Um, it created a visually darker pattern. However, it merged together the terminal dendrites um, and created more like blobby structures. So the figure on the right uh, presents a different clay slip from the other two. It contained granular rutile, which created a bumpy texture due to the particle size of the granular rutile. This design shows more of a random walk effect rather than marangoni. The iron oxide in this case avoided regions where the granular rutile was um, and dispersed where it can, forming distinct terminals. It is more of like explosion-like or star-like structure than um, the one shown on the left, which is more flower-like. So this shows the drastic difference between pre-fired and post-fired results. While the results were pretty dark when they were initially created, they definitely faded away after being treated with heat in the kiln. One side note is that while optimal clay slip recipe became a smooth uniform cream color in the, in the kiln, the other clay slip recipe, which involved granular rutile, actually darkened, and you can see the little specks of granular rutile um, on, the, on the clay slip. So higher concentrations of oxide were shown to produce more darker and therefore more aesthetically pleasing results. The figure on the left contained one half of the standard iron oxide slip loading, while the figure on the far right had double amount of loading. So as you can see, the progression was from kind of not, it was visible, but kind of barely visible to really, really dark. So we believe this can actually help when firing because it can make the results darker or actually more visible. So no successes could be possible without numerous fails. Uh, there was actually one point in the lab when Dr. Goldsmith was worried that if a miracle didn't happen um, and the results didn't show up, I will probably run away and not work with him. So which would probably not be the case, but but still. The top two layers show Rutel as the pigment source. And while the majority of them are failure blobs, which do not have any hopes for dendrites, um, the one on the, the first vector on the second row actually gave us hope that we can make it work. It dispersed a little bit, even though the visibility is still faint and can be considered a failure. The third row shows iron oxide, the same iron oxide which was shown slides prior. So those experiments were pH related. And for example, if there was water instead of acid, um, it would form a blob instead of a dendrite. So on the bottom, we tried other colors um, and pigments instead of 
you know, simply brown and black. Interestingly enough, cobalt oxides exhibited um, the Marangoni effect, which created hope that dendritic pattern can be found. So as you can see, it has this dispersion aspect of Marangoni effect, but it's more speckled and not dendritic. So, so far we got a beautiful speckled blob. Copper sulfate was probably the nicest of the failed results because it was non-existent on the clay slip and produced a greenish halo upon firing. So it was, it was a beautiful fail. Um, okay, so experience. Mocha diffusion proved itself to be more complex than just simple art or aimless trial and error game. Despite the complexity of numerous variables and many more experiments to go, one thing that can be strongly said about Marangoni effect is that it's definitely not the only mechanism happening here. We believe that understanding science behind art could eventually lead to more beautiful patterns and results, since every pattern can be enhanced based on chemical interactions and ingredients. For me personally, this research helped me um, to become familiar with formulating hypotheses and finding new ways to move forward when the result was obtained. I definitely became more comfortable with hypothesis oriented methods to make failed experiments actually work. So our next steps involve further pH experiments and acidification of the clay col colloid, finding better dendritic formation for other pigments, including root tile, cobalt, oxide, and many others, and observing dendritic formations under the effect of gravity. Speaking of which, the figure on the right is the result of gravity effect. So if you go back to slide 12, and if you see um, the third picture of iron oxide, this was on a horizontal surface. So when it was dripped, it was a horizontal surface and it created a, a blob. It wasn't really dendritic. However, when we turned the, the test tile over and it was in a vertical position, it formed those beautiful uh, dendrites going down. So a gravity is definitely something that, would, that should be experimented with forward. Plus, considering that all of the clay, like vases or bowls, they're not horizontal. They're typically vertical, they stand. And in order to produce the results, a gravity effect would have to be observed. So uh, this is, these are just my references slides. And I would like to thank Dean Peter Shoemaker, Dean Shiloh Riley for supporting the Petersheim expositions. And I would also like to thank Dr. Goldsmith for guiding me in this research and just tolerating me in the lab. So yeah, thank you so much. Great presentation, Diana. Yes, I tolerated you. No, I think we had a lot of fun, actually. Um, Dr. Morris, I see that you came um, possibly a little late. If you have any questions, we'd definitely love to hear from you to see any insight from uh, another scientist. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was eating dinner and I got completely distracted. Uh, no worries. <laughs> um, I never tried to fire it, so I'm interested to hear that it made a difference. Uh, I naively assume that firing it would just fix the pattern, but I guess you're telling me that it doesn't just fix the pattern. Um, and well, the, the ceramicists use all kinds of different things, not just iron oxide. So I don't know what the ceramicist would say about all that. But. Well, as a ceramicist, I would say it was our sort of baby that we used. Um, so Diane isn't as familiar with the firing process as I am, but everything has um, um, volatility. You just have to get it to the right temperature. So iron is actually one of the chemicals that in a kiln will come off most readily. Um, ah, okay. So it can evaporate. So like if you have a white pot next to an, a pot with a lot of iron on it, your pot's not going to be white when it comes out of the kiln. Uh, okay. Okay. Let me just get yeah. yeah. Um, if there's okay, any so other I, questions. Oh, I ahead. just I just uh, did it in the, the version that I have on my web page. I, I have to tell you that I cheated a bit. I not only put a few drops on there to make the pattern, but I kept feeding it. So so I kind of uh, added more uh, iron oxide as the pattern developed. I kept flooding it with with uh, a solution. So that that may explain why it's more filled in. Uh, than the ones, some of the ones you show where the pattern is just at the edges of the dendro, the, the tips kind of. Yeah. Yeah, those are all like one drop experiments. Yeah, I, I didn't wait. I just put more drops on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions from the audience? Go for it, uh, Reese. You're muted right now. 
So when you switch to like trying to apply this to full on pottery with vases and stuff versus the flat surface, do you have any expectations as to whether you might have to like change the viscosity of the dye liquid so it doesn't just run off of the pottery or do you think that it should be fine as is? Go ahead, Diana, if you want to tap tackle that one. Well, so far we haven't really experimented with gravity. This is our um, kind of next step. So yes, definitely viscosity should be tested, but we don't have a viscometer, so this would be kind of a trial and error sort of uh, before we can figure out the the viscosity of um, the perfect viscosity for like a vertical surface. Um, and also, I think it depends on the way you turn the vase or the bowl, for example, because um, in some cases, what I consider we can if if a horizontal slip works, we can pour it horizontally and kind of make it run off on the sides. I think Dr. Gosman probably knows what I'm talking about. Like if there's a vase, you pour it on the side and it pours down instead of pouring it vertically because it creates stripes going down. So maybe this star like pattern would form if it's actually horizontal and there's still some gravity effect, but not as detrimental. Yeah, I can add to that too really quick. Um, I've messed around with this a, a lot more and by mess around, I mean, I'm in the pottery studio just kind of <laughs> potion mixing stuff. Um, and you can get various interesting effects um, by how you apply, even apply the slip and you can make the slip and the um, oxide solution run together as well. So there's all kinds of things we just don't know exactly how to formulate yet that we're, you know, we're thinking about. There's a lot of variables, yep. Yeah. OK, cool. Thank you. Sure. I think somebody else unmuted themselves momentarily. Uh, Andy K, were you unmuted and want to chat? Oh no, but I was just really interested by everything. I've never really seen art and science kind of come together in this way. So this was a very interesting presentation. I really liked it. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess if we're out of um, questions, uh, we could all thank the speaker. Uh, thank you, Diana. Thanks for doing research with me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morris, for uh, coming from Canada and listening in really quick. And if if you have any uh, any other insights or want to go back a few slides. Um, uh, I'd like to see the beginning slides, but I don't want to take you too far aside. Sure. Here.